Asia, the new center of the world game. One in two football fans globally live on this continent. Here, homegrown legends rise and champions are crowned. Proud nations fly their colors and tribes of fans in booming cities unleash their energy. Intense, diverse. Here, local is king. It's a new era of Asian football, a new type of fandom, a new chapter to an historic story. to today how does one introduce one of the best known faces in the global sports industry i had him down as four decades he's he's corrected me as over five decades so if you have just landed from mars uh, lord sebastian co currently serves as the non-executive chairman of csm sport and entertainment and president of world athletics as an athlete he won olympic gold medals in the 1500 meters in 1980 1984 he set 12 middle distance world records he then went on to become member of parliament and later chaired the london organizing committee of the 2012 olympic and paralympic games since then he's become the chairman of the british olympic association and non-exec chairman of csm sport and entertainment who've been very helpful in today uh, and has received numerous honors throughout his career in the summer of 2020, he was approved as an International Olympic Committee member and now can add the Sports Matters Academy to that list of achievements. Um, so rather than talking, about, and also rather than talking about the future of the sports industry today, um, we want to find out more about him. Um, how did he get to where he is and what advice can he give for people wanting to succeed in the sports industry? Um, so, so. Seb, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Nips, I'm going to ask if we can go picture in picture on this because this is about him, not about me. Thank you so much. Where in the world are you today? I'm sitting in the CSM headquarters in London, uh, where I've been uh, during the course of the week. It's been a busy week. Uh, the usual you know, rough and tumble of a sports and entertainment agency, but always good fun. And actually, we're doing pretty well at the moment. Fantastic. So, so live sports are coming back yep. all over the world. Um, some some places are way way more advanced than others. But what did the last two years look like for you? Oh, it was a roller coaster. I think it's look. I'm no different. Or we're no different as a sector. I'm no different than an individual. Uh, we know the last two years impacted on everybody. Uh, we went in, in fairness, with a, I think a slightly sort of romantic view that this was going to be the great level or everybody was in it together. I think sadly it wasn't the great level. I think it, if it proved to be anything but the great leveler, communities that were most vulnerable in the past were most vulnerable uh, in the last. We have to accept the hardest hit community uh, has been young people. Uh, their, their loss in some cases of sporting activity, physical and mental um, well-being, the social interactions that are so crucial in formative years, some of the educational attainments and aspirations, and, and in a way the knock-on for their career uh, glide path as well. So, no, no, this has been, this has been tough, and, and in the sports world, of course, everything came to a grinding halt. And if it came to a grinding halt in sport, then it hit hard the, all the supplementary uh, supporting, you know, augmenting businesses uh, uh, around sport, including agencies like our own. So it was, a, it was a tough period for sport. It was certainly a tough period for the rights holders and the agencies involved in sport, particularly those putting on events. And actually it was a, challenging period for brands as well because you know they built their two three four year strategies 
for embedding their brand, particularly at community level through sport, and and they didn't have they didn't have that vehicle available to them. And the most impacted, you know, and we should never overlook that. And why would I, as president of World Athletics, you have to say that it were it, it's been the competitors, you know, to have gone, for instance, in an Olympic sport from an absolute laser-like focus for a games in Tokyo that was supposed to be taking place in 2020 and then suddenly to be told in March of, of, of that year, actually they're not, you know, the opening ceremony is not July in a few months time, but it's a year. I mean, I know that I, <clears throat> I can sort of feel that in, in any number of hats that I've worn because clearly as, a, as you were kind enough, Jasper, to mention the, the London years, but. I can't. I can only imagine how I would have felt if somebody walked into my office in March of 2012 and said, "Oh, by the way, your opening ceremony is now in in 2013," and, and all the challenges around venues, contracts, uh, the ability to mothball, uh, and 9,000 people are all ready to deliver the best work of their lives. You've then got to sort of ease out of them the, 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 the frustration and the tiredness because everybody's running on empty before a games and then get them to refocus in a year's time. No, it, it's, but the athletes, I think if you, if you identified one group who I think have come through this in an extraordinary way, it's the competitors who just showed massive resilience in terms of just mentally losing something that they had been focusing on. Then, of course, all the physicality, the infrastructure that was available to them suddenly became closed, particularly if they were owned you know, by public institutions. And I was receiving video content by the day from our competitors who were on the balconies of condos in Florida and hurling across big plastic you know, water tanks. It's, you know, it was a challenge, but they came through it. And I think we saw in Tokyo performances that just, in a way, they they defined the word resilience. You know, it's, it's interesting what you say about teens as well. We just had the, the I, I'm in Singapore. We just had the the, IR, the the HSBC Rugby Sevens here a couple of weekends ago. And it was great to see, I've got, I've got a teenage daughter, and it was great to see her being able to be a teenager in the stands again and actually enjoying sport and being with her mates and everyone getting dressed up and it was it was so so wonderful so 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 i mean you talked about resilience of the of the the, the players and the athletes and um, what positives for the sports industry as a whole do you think have come from the last two years i think there are a number well first of all we've learned to work remotely we've learned to engage with the technology that links you and i up today uh, it's allowed, certainly in my own federation, it's allowed me uh, to be more connected with the sport, not just operationally integrated, but emotionally connected to 212 countries that form the basis of world athletics. My area presidents, continental presidents, um, you know, in a few hours time, I'm joining a, or I'm chairing a, uh, an information session for my council. Uh, and the whole council will come on board uh, in exactly the way we're talking now. And that those are members from as far and um, wide range areas as Norfolk Island and, and Manaus, San Diego and Beijing. I mean, and, and that's how we, we, we operate. I think also um, it's meant that we have been, we've had to be very much more careful and selective about the journeys uh, and you know, the, our, our sustainability strategies. I think we've just all recognized that, you know, if we have a sustainability strategy, it's probably better to live to it rather than just get back to the old practices of flying eight time zones over 12, 13 hours to have a meeting, have supper and then come back. You know, the, I think those days are over. I think the other interesting thing for me is, um, it is how are we coping with what in many cases is a hybrid working pattern. I know in CSM we've now got, you know, we've got back to uh, a structure. People are working as hard. The, the numbers are looking uh, as well. They're, they're looking better than ever. So I think we've all recognised that there are things that we will take into the 
uh, you know, hopefully into the future here when we get back to, you know, some kind of normality, although I don't think that in a way is going to happen that quickly. But I do think it means that uh, there are some very strong lessons uh, that we have taken. And I think learning to work remotely. I think, interestingly, I, I interviewed Toto Wolf the other day uh, for my foundation uh, lunch. Uh, and we, we had a long conversation about what it was like to operate a team effectively remotely. I know that wearing my own hat, you know, in, in football and other team sports. Uh, and actually, funnily enough, sports people are more used to working remotely because that's often what they do in, in track and field. It's not unusual to have coaches based in different continents where, you know, your main contact during the course of either a training day or post a competition is immediately to, to link up on, on laptop and discuss, you know, some of the finer points of technique or what even the training session the following day looks like. Everybody said, oh, it must be really tough. Uh, actually, the point I made is that the sports sector was probably better prepared to work remotely than almost any other sector. So, so final question about the last two years, and then let's, let's start looking forward. But um, we have the cornflake moment saying, so so what happened? What has happened in the last two years for you that made you drop your spoon into your cornflakes and go, wow? I've had a lot of those, but I guess for me, if you identified one of them, it was the extraordinary race in Tokyo uh, over the 400 meter hurdles, uh, Carsten Borholm and Rye Benjamin. And literally they ran toe to toe to the line. Carsten was a little stronger in the last 30 paces and then rupturing uh, his own world record in such an unbelievable way. Um, I, and the look on his face, and I remember sitting in the stand uh, in the competition. It was a it was a spectatorless stadium, but a lot of officials and a lot of teams. And it's the first time I've stood with a council in a sport, certainly my own sport, and with people who themselves were record holders and Olympic champions. And we just all looked at each other speechless for a few moments at, at what we witnessed. So the spoon very, very clearly dropped into the plate of cornflakes on that occasion. Fantastic. So let, let's let's move on to today. What what do you think coming out of all of this? Do you th what what are the main challenges facing the sports industry today? Uh, oh, look, I, I think the main challenge facing sport per se is how do we remain relevant, interesting, exciting in the lives of young people? Uh, and our challenge, you know, I, I, I always say to my teams in world athletics, and I'm sure other sports are saying it as well, and if they're not, they should be, that our main competition isn't from other sports. You know, I don't sit there wondering what swimming is doing or gymnastics or, or other Olympic sports or even football or F1, uh, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to figure out how in a competitive and cluttered and complicated landscape for young people, do we make sure that we remain front and center in their lives? And, you know, you talked about, you know, my longevity in the sport. I have witnessed, even in my own career, you know, a sport that was being focused on and featured effectively, you know, when I was, you know, breaking world records on only three TV channels. You know, we now, and, and if you look at the fractured nature of media, the number of platforms, the fact that you and I in five years time are not going to be talking probably about five or six dominant broadcasters that, you know, we can see graphically uh, the way that's going. I think the other challenge in uh, uh, the broader challenge, and I think it's the same for rights holders or brands or, or any part of the ecosystem in sport, particularly that's trying to curate, um, you know, their, their commercial partners uh, and, and sell, you know, their rights is the agenda uh, post the last two years, which I think has really been turbocharged, 
is around environment, ethical practices, and health and fitness, both mental and physical. Uh, and, you know, I often laugh with my teams, uh, both CSM and in World Athletics, and I say, you know, actually, when I'm doing chemistry, chemistry sessions with brands, or as a, as a rights holder, or as an agency, I'm probably just as, it's just as important for me to have our head of sustainability or the teams running ESG um, as it is to have a commercial director because the first hour or so of any discussion is, you know, what is your diversity and inclusion policies as it should be? You know, where are you sourcing your services, you know, your, your manufacturing, you know, are, are, they, are they ethical, are they in accordance with ILO standards, you know, all these things are now beginning to matter. Uh, and, and, and certainly, we have to understand that young people uh, have a consumer sovereignty here, and their consumer sovereignty is immersed in all the big moral hotspots, the moral crossroads in our lives. They're profoundly anti-discriminatory. They are, um, you know, they, they have very strong trenchant views about environment, uh, about diversity and inclusion, uh, and they don't any longer, even if even if they sort of don't identify it uh, as anything other than maybe a subliminal observation, they don't sit there looking at us as simply sports agencies or or sporting organisations or political parties or charities or or businesses. They uh, they also ask themselves a very fundamental question. And that question is, does this organization look like the world or reflect the world that I live in? And if it doesn't, they tend to move on to other organizations or other activities. So it's a, it's a very changed landscape. I think smart organizations were picking up on the hints and the direction of travel. But I do think the last two years, particularly around government agendas focusing on health, fitness, physical and mental uh, has really, really... That is a challenge, but I think it's also a huge opportunity for sport. Because, you know, if you, you know, I will go to my grave knowing that sport is the best and most potent social worker in any of our communities. And it is also, you know, with all its challenges, it is also actually used properly by governments it's also the smartest soft diplomat you know i've often i've so often been in in circumstances and surroundings where sport has played a seismic role in, in social cohesion in nation building and i've seen it time and time again i've seen it over four decades um so so, so how do you i mean you're talking about a lot of issues around Ethics, mental health, diversity. I mean, it's a huge, huge subject, and and and, and it's not today. We, we really want to talk about careers and 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 the, the sports industry. Um, but 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 how do you see the sports business changing? Things like attributes and knowledge. Um, what, what what do you think is going to be required for the future compared to when you first started in the sports business? Well, first of all, the landscape is a more demanding landscape. There's a great deal more transparency and social media has, of course, turbocharged much of that. So your decisions that could be made, certainly in federations behind closed doors, in, you know, inverted commas, the famous, you know, smoke-filled rooms of, of all political chambers, is over. Now, in World Athletics, for instance, we post all the decisions we take at a council meeting, literally within minutes of the end of the council meeting. So our member federations can see exactly what decision has been taken, the rationale behind it, and who supported it and who didn't. Uh, and, you know, if I just focus on that just for one moment, you know, you will remember a few years ago, uh, we had our own challenges in world athletics. We rewrote the constitution, we collapsed two constitutions into one, we, delivered a created an athletic integrity unit not just dealing with our um, anti-doping policies but policies of vetting the people to make sure we had the right people with the right motives uh, and integrity 
uh, in our sport. We, we've done a lot of things. Uh, and before we set off down that journey, we asked ourselves three questions. And I think it's the questions that all sports uh, and the industry themselves are going to have to address if they haven't already. And that is, you know, how do we make decisions that are clear and transparent? How do you cut away the undergrowth so that every tier of your organization understands how you get to where you've got to? The second question, and it's a tough one, is who do you want in your organization? Uh, you want, and, you know, and, and that really is also about the creation of checks and balances around the balance of power and the way people discharge duties and roles and responsibilities. And then the most crucial question, which we all have to answer, which is how do you grow your sport? How do you grow the organization? But I don't think you can answer the third without answering the first two. Uh, and I haven't even talked, I mean, we talked about a lot of the challenges and a lot of opportunities. I haven't even talked about, you know, NFT, crypto or, or meta, uh, which is now you know, it's, it, it's not sort of sci-fi or, you know, or interesting arcane articles tucked away in, you know, sort of techie magazines. It's with us. It's with us. You look at a company like Nike, who just, you know, patented on the meta 17, 18 of their own products. And everywhere, you know, you go now, there are organizations in sport that have, you know, created and generated a really interesting income uh, around NFTs and, and crypto is... You know, is is now a, you know it, 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 it's not an unfathomable um, vehicle as well for sport. It's you know this is with us. So these are all the interesting things. I think the the other key area for me here, uh, and it's really uh, an interesting one, it's that in any organisation, the notion of power has I think dramatically altered. You know, we talk about governing bodies in sports, a very Victorian view of what you do. Actually, uh, an organisation like World Athletics or FIFA or FINA it should really be much more about empowering people in the sport and in the different, you know, tiers and layers, ecosystems of your sport. And, you know, the old days of people coming to your office as the president of, all, of an organization and asking permission to do something is, is really gone. What you know they're really doing is they're coming into your office, they're not asking to move permission, they're asking you how you think you can help them do it. And so for me, that's a much more current and topical definition of, an, of empowerment. I, I wish in a way we could get rid of the word governing bodies in sport because it's, it's a very hierarchical, rather old-fashioned view of the way you deliver your services. Um, very interesting. And then, and then kind of, I think, looking tighter into, you know, the World Athletics Championships, um, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, how, how are sports, how's athletics uh, connecting with new fans? How's it growing? And, you know, what are the challenges, do you think, for, for the World Athletics Championships that, that face over the next 10 years, such as connecting with new audiences? What, what are the main challenges you think the event faces? Well, they're all the challenges that actually in our own sport we've undertaken. Um, the, this year is a really good example. Uh, we have a World Championships in the United States just in a few months' time in Eugene, Oregon. Absolutely vital marketplace to be in, of course. You know, the, the US market is still, for sport, is still the largest market by a distance in the world. Um, but for, for track and field, for athletics, it's a strong sport. It's a very strong sport at high school level. Uh, and in the college program, although it's been hit like most college programs in the last two years, it's still very strong. But we've lost ground on some of what I would describe as the, you know, the stable American sports like, you know, NFL and, um, uh, baseball, basketball, um, even even sports that are very perhaps strong in, uh, in in some universities around you know volleyball, lacrosse. These are all sports uh, that you know are are powerful, and we we need to push ahead. We've got a really good opportunity. We've got the World Championships this year. We've got a, a an Olympic Games in 2028. That's an interesting glide path. And in our own sport, 
we've created a, a tier of competition called uh, Continental Tour. Uh, we had very little presence in the States uh, up until a couple of years ago. We've now got many of those events. Uh, and we need to keep making sure that we are engaging with young fans, young audiences, uh, and we're using absolutely to full effect all the tools of engagement. Um, and, and broadcast is important. You know, we mustn't, you know, of course, you know, it, it's a very fragmented, both technically and in terms of, uh, of format. Ah, just before I got onto the, uh, the 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 technical question, uh, we seem to. Are you still there? Are you back? I'm. We're I back. See, I can see you and I can hear you clearly. Yeah, we we lost you for a little bit there. I mean, this is one of the things about being out, working remotely means that I'm in Singapore, you're in London. We can chat to each other, but every now and then the internet does play its its little, its little hand. Um, so you you were you were talking about. Uh, the, 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 the development of, of the championship. Yeah. Look, you know, we are a very part of strong sport. Um, we have strong assets. Uh, some areas we're stronger than others. There's no doubt to me, you know, there's a lot that we can do and we are going to do uh, in the lead up to the uh, 2028 Olympic Games uh, to make sure that track and field really is, you know, it, it, it's punching its, it, it's punching its weight uh, in, in, in that journey. Uh, and as I said, I think before the technology collapsed for a few moments, we're using every, you know, every engagement vehicle uh, 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 available to us and working closely with the United States uh, uh, Track and Field Federation uh, as well. Uh, and look, you know, we have some very strong assets. More people do what we do in, in terms of the running element of our sport than in, in, in any other sport. Over the course of a couple of weeks, hundreds of millions of people identify themselves as um, recreational runners. If we go back to the agenda of the last two years, which is really now heightened, you know, we're probably better placed than any other sport to tap into that uh, because the health, well-being, physical and mental of our communities uh, is most accessible as an agenda through 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 running, um, and you know that's that's something that we are really going to focus on. Uh, we've got a couple of campaigns that have been very powerful campaigns in our sport. One is around clean air. You know, if we're not a sport that's promoting clean air, uh, then we're probably not about much else. Uh, that is really important. You know, we, we talk a lot about getting people fit and healthy and, and ideally through running. Uh, but we don't want to be set, we don't want to be replacing one set of pathologies with another set of pathologies because we're encouraging them to do it in, in, in environments where, you know, the air quality is, is, is potentially injurious to them. I think the other area for us too is to make sure that we form even stronger partnerships uh, with those uh, NGOs and, and governments out there that have recognised that sport is a really, really vital tool uh, in, in that journey for neighbourhood wellbeing and fitness. There's, I mean, that's a fantastic segue into the next section. So I want to talk about the, the real crux of this is about career, you know, working in the sports industry um, sometimes in some parts of the world, sport suffers to gain credibility as a career choice, particularly amongst an older generation who might want their kids to be doctors or lawyers or accountants and stuff. Um, and we, you know, we do a lot of work with music and gaming, which faces the same issues. Um, how can we make a career in sport more sexy? Maybe that's the wrong word, but. Well, I'm probably not a really reliable witness here because as Chancellor of Loughborough University, which for the last six years has been voted the top, the, num the, the, the number one sports university in the world, and I'm not just talking about performance, but you know, our, all our sports science courses, which are oversubscribed about eight to one, um, we take sports and the potential for careers from sport very, very seriously. Uh, and. You know, I'm sitting here 
uh, in a premier agency uh, in the world of sport, knowing how in, how crucial and important we take, um, you know, people's careers, helping them, you know, helping them generate careers beyond even this agency. A lot of our talented people go on to take up commercial roles and responsibilities in governing bodies. And here we are using the same expression, but in, in our international national federations, uh, they go on into working alongside brands in-house. I mean, it, and, and the genesis, the basis of so much of that is sport. I take Jasper the broader point though, uh, and that is that we need sometimes to be able to explain uh, the career opportunities uh, in a crisper and clearer way uh, for, for people in sport. Uh, and actually often, uh, the one area that I know from other hats that I wear commercially, that, you know, all being equal uh, on a CV of equal ability and academic rigor and, uh, and experience, you do tend to go for those that have got uh, a sporting background because you also know uh, that they've been able to subject themselves at whatever level they've played the sport to a period of focus and, you know, collegiate, um, uh, collegiate uh, engagement because team sports is, is extremely important for that. And if it's an individual sport, you know that they have the ability to, you know, to focus and, and probably work remotely and not being supervised all the time. So, you know, and, and, and if you're looking at the health and well-being of an organization, you'd rather have people in there that are looking after their health, and often that's done through sport, than organizations where, you know, people are just sort of hanging through the day because they don't really have the, the physical reserves to get through it. So I'm not saying it's the only thing you would look at, but I do think that, you know, I am always, I would say this, wouldn't I? I'm always attracted to, on a CV to somebody that has been engaged at whatever level in sport, because I think they'll have insights into things that are going to be helpful to your organization. There's a there's a very strong message that came that comes through when we talk to create, you know, TikTokers and YouTubers and creators in that space and gamers um, that, that, that it's always do what you love. And that that's that's come across clearly, clearly there as well. Um, talking about careers, what is what's the best career advice you've ever had and what advice could you give for anyone looking to get into the sports industry? Well, the worst career advice I've probably ever had was from a careers, um, well, somebody who was nominally responsible for careers at a school I was in in Sheffield, which was, you know, forget athletics, you know, the chances of you doing anything are really limited. Um, then the worst career advice I had actually was from a group of coaches back in my teens that told me I'd never be um, tall enough to uh, run a fast 800 meters and never strong enough to be a miler. And I sort of managed to disprove that slightly. So I'm always wary of anybody dis di distributing career advice to anybody. Uh, and I don't mean that in a sort of cavalier or, you know, sort of insouciant way. I just actually think people figure it out. Uh, and you do what you have a passion for. Uh, and the best career advice I can give anybody is do not effectively be told that you can't do something either because nobody's done it before or, you know, it, it's just not something that you're cut out to do because if you genuinely believe that it's something you want to do, I would absolutely encourage that person, that young person, to to explore it. And look, you know, not everything has a fairy tale ending. Sometimes, you know, you're going to get to the point where you realise, you know, it, it was really interesting. I uh, going back to my interview with Toto Wolf for my foundation, the Sedco Foundation, just the other day. You know, he said, look, I got to the point in my early twenties when I realised I was never going to make the cut as a motor racer. You know, I drove, I was okay, but I just didn't have the cognitive skills 
to do what I recognised around me other people were doing better. Uh, and he then went off and focused on creating a really smart investment business, created a motor racing talent agency, and then of course, you know, the rest is history with what he did in you know, the first instance at Williams and then obviously creating the dynasty that is now Mercedes. But that actually started with somebody who was advised not to do in the early years what he went off to do and tried to do with a passion. It didn't work out, but he found other navigable routes through to stay within the same, you know, curtilage of passion. So I'm, I'm always a little bit, a little bit nervous about orthodox career advice um, because actually I think your career in the end, what you choose to do, you don't choose to do it almost in a way through circumstance and sometimes coincidence uh, and, you know, a little bit of judgment occasionally. It chooses you. Very nice. Was it, there was a football manager, I can't remember who it was, once said, to be a jockey, you don't have to have been a horse. Um, and then, okay, yeah. so final question. We're, we're running very short on time, yeah. unfortunately. And unfortunately, how could we t put a time limit on a conversation with Seb Co? But I know, I know that your, your time is busy. So the final question for you, Seb, is, is what's really exciting for Seb Co right now? Everything I do. Uh, and I'm very lucky to do that. You know, I'm, I'm chairing a fabulous agency with really, really smart young people, which is great. I'm president of a sport that I became a, an active participant in from the age of 11 uh, and worked my way through the ranks. Uh, and, you know, touch wood, you know, I'm healthy and able to, you know, work out a little bit still. So, yeah, everything I do, I, I, I do with enjoyment. And I, I know I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do that. And it's a, it's a, it's a rare privilege probably, but yeah, I, I do count my blessings. That's fantastic. Well, what a, what a wonderful way to, to end this, this, this conversation seven. And yeah, you know, we talked about uh, teens, careers, resilience, working remotely, but staying connected. We talked about remaining relevant with the youth and growing audiences and, and, we talked about environment, ethics, mental health, diversity, um, th this concept of no more smoke filled uh, rooms. Um, we talked to, we touched on crypto. Now, I would have loved to have gone more into the whole crypto and NFT world. We we'll do that next next time. And hopefully, we'll see you in Singapore on the 26th, the 28th of September. Um, uh, this concept of don't listen to your career advisors is absolutely awesome. Um, doing what you love, which is which is just such a wonderful thing. Um, and, and then don't be told you can't do something. Your career can choose you and everything is exciting. So with that, uh, Lord Sebastian Coe, Seb Coe, one of the greatest sports people and industry leaders of all time. Thank you so much for joining the, the Sports Matters Academy. Um, we are going to have a chance to chat with you in, a, in, the, in the private room. Uh, there's a very limited number. So you just, if you're on the site now, you just click on the button and it'll take you into the room. If you, if I'm, I'm afraid that if it runs out of numbers, it's first come, first serve. But again, Seb, thank you so much for joining the Academy.